Hello everyone and welcome back to the Virtual Railroader Academy. I'm your host, Professor Casey. And I'm Professor Nick and we appreciate having your company for another episode of Railroaders Play Railroader. Yeah, Railroaders Play Railroader. This is Logging Railroads 202. Uh, and a quick happy National Train Day to everyone out there. Um, didn't realize we were streaming on National Train Day until this morning. Um, mm. But we have a very special guest today. Uh, we have the executive director of the NCEO. Uh, yeah. NCEO yeah, yeah. I mean... of the, uh, the Western Forest Industries Museum. Please welcome uh, our special guest lecturer, Miss <laughs> Beth Ann Marr. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. You didn't put the disclaimer on that I needed, the, like, hashtag not a gamer. Yes, hashtag not a gamer. Um, hashtag, like, 30-year-old boomer. First video game since N64 Mario Kart, and uh, mm -hmm. you're playing Railroad. And that was traumatic for me. Yeah, that was traumatic yes. for me in the 90s. You know, I usually lost the Penguins were evil. <laughs> well... Welcome to uh, the Railroader, and we're uh, we're very excited to have you on. You guys are doing uh, some cool things out there in uh, in uh, the Mount Rainier world, um, and uh, we're we're excited to hear all about all about it tonight. Yeah, thanks. This is like a totally fun new forum. Uh, yeah, no, we we have a. I'm just foaming right now watching the. Uh, I think that's the fast mail come into town. Yep, that is the fast mail. Uh, sorry, foaming a little bit as they come into town. Um, but we, we've so got a, we've got one of your engines here in the game. Yeah, and, uh, which I didn't even know was a thing, but it's yeah, that's sort of exciting and cool. So uh, for you guys out there tonight, uh, it's all about logging. We're going to be talking about the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, their awesome plans, and uh, we're going to be uh, starting off with uh, everyone's favorite locomotive, the Nada Minaret. The not a minaret. The not a minaret. Uh, well, turntables line next. So you wanna, you guys yeah, wanna climb sure, into the I cab, can... and we'll start backing out as we talk about uh, not a minaret. Yeah, let's get back out here. But yeah, so this uh, this episode came about because uh, I've been uh, had the pleasure of working with. Bethan uh, in helping with editing their vlogs and as we were, were coming up with ideas of things to do for the show here it dawned on me, wait a minute we have a, an engine that exists in real life and I know the person who's connected to the IRL engine so let's make this a thing, let's like introduce real person to virtual engine of uh, real engine that they have so, so what does it feel like <laughs> seeing this this piece of equipment that you have a fair amount of experience with uh, in a video game setting? I mean, I was just standing by. I was about to say, like, that's a good roll-by. Uh, <laughs> it looks like the running gear looks a little shinier. So, yeah, no, it's, it's funny because, like I was saying just before we started the call, um, the, for us, it's the 17th. Um, you know, and she's one of the locomotives that's been operational since I've been there. And I think um, sometimes we just sort of we forget about her. Like she's she's cute and she's pretty agile, but she's also a uh, pain in the butt to work on because everything is just so condensed. Um, so it's sort of funny that uh, it's funny for me that that's the one that's being featured. Um, you know, it's not the one that uh, is usually the foamiest engine. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I hadn't known about this engine until the game, uh, until I started hopping into Railroader and trying to, kind of learning about it and seeing how cool it was. And um, it's it's cool to, you know, kind of hop into a game and learn about a new thing. We're all full up on fuel. So we'll uh, check in with our yard master and make sure we can just go uh, pin onto our train. Uh, hey, the, you, not a, the not a gamer question. Yes. Am I cool hanging out on the back here? Where are you hanging out? You just hooked I'm onto just, the back? Just... Oh, on the, on the back steps? 
Yeah. Yeah, so as long as you can stay on, you're fine. I mean, no. I don't know if I have two points of contact. Um, there's the fireman seat in the cab, too. Yeah. Wherever you find okay, comfortable. Uh, if you want to stand on top of the locomotive, too, I mean, that that's fair game. I mean, fair game I don't get to do it in... If I don't get to do it in real life, it seems oh, like oh, I just fell off. I was trying to do that. See if I can get up there. I, I think that if, from the ladder in the back, you can. I don't know. If oh, there we go. Fine. I just I jenga it. I uh, Mario'd my way up. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, seven. Uh, not seventeen. Wow. Uh, one oh nine. Calling the yardmaster. Yeah, uh, yardmaster here. Uh, yeah, we're looking to. Get out into your yard, uh, pin onto our cars, and uh, get the heck out of Dodge. Uh, yep, you should be lined right onto your cut. All right, copy that. I'll get our switches. Our switches have been gotten for us. All right, going ahead. I'll uh, just keep hanging out up here up front then. So while we're uh, attached to our cars, uh, what is the the history of the real seventeen? The real 17, um, let's see, was started, I believe, was commissioned for a logging operation in um, California. Um, and then that's where it spent most of her, like, actual running life, as we've been talking that um, it's sort of funny that some of our locomotives are now coming up on more years in passenger service um, than they are actually in logging, but um, she was, let's see, built for the Cross at Western in Oregon, and then, um, that's right, was sold to uh, the Hammond Lumber Company in 1942. Um, and then, you know, they had a fire that destroyed a lot of their trestles and the access to tracks, so she was one of the engines that just sort of um, sat in the woods for 20 years, which is quite frankly that's most of the engines that we have on site at Mount Rainier um, until a yet mill owner named Gus Peterson decided that he was going to rescue her um, and, you know, get her out of the woods where she'd been dusting and decaying. So, um, yeah, it's where in the next five or five or so years we're coming up on all of our engines having more time in service under tourist operations than they are under logging operations. Um, so, and then I guess mechanically of interest, she's identical to a K28, except for the gauge. Which so, I find hilarious. Know. Yeah, which I, I uh, actually half a didn't car know neck. that. 10 feet, 5, 2, 1, bang. You can you can stop there. I know. I was working okay. on that part. <laughs> yeah, it seems to me it, for for such a when people say tank engine, I mean your general public is going to think Thomas, uh, and this is kind of <laughs> Thomas, but this is a bigger bigger brother to Thomas because yeah. the fact. Uh, the fact that it is a tank engine is kind of disarming because it is really robust for such a small package. Yeah, she looks, she's just, um, it's like she's got a, she's got all the workings of like a much larger tank engine and she's just sort of like compressed and just together. But um, I guess actually when she sat out in the woods, the, they would still they'd fill up um all their log trucks out of her um uh, mm. they just they fill the tank keep the tank filled um so even when she was sitting there sort of trapped and abandoned um i guess that was that was her only purpose and what have obviously every steam locomotive has its own personality and what have your crews said about 17's personality <laughs> that's appropriate <laughs> that's that's um, fit for advertisers like fit for advertisers 
<laughs> well, they they used to call her a little like a Japanese compact car, um, because like just because she was compact and it was sort of a a pain to work on. <laughs> Um, so there was all the car analogies. I think, um, she's a little high maintenance. Like, ah. she's pretty. She, she has standards. She's, um, I think if most, most of our, the guys who have run her would describe her, maybe with the exception of a few, it's sort of, it's like, the older woman with the bleach blonde hair at the bar, like, on her third martini. That maybe uh. shouldn't be. Um, I, I think that that's her personality. If you can paint that picture of the dive bar in the the regular, that's at the same seat. Right on. That's really really done up and like mm, maybe didn't need that third martini. That would I, be the seventeen. Would that come from just <laughs> how she was built or just the amount of service that? The, the the amount and the nature of the service that she worked in before Forest Era operations. All of the above. Um, like I said, if you look at the like running gear, and actually you can probably see it on the game. Um, it's you know like some of our other engines are just they're easier to work on. You know you're not in such a compact space. Like the engine, she fights you when you try and do repair work to her. Um, like, she just doesn't make it easy. She's not a good patient. Um, and then, you know, it's, I mean, and that's the thing is, she's Mount Rainier Phoenix. Um, you know, we had a benefactor, Tom Murray, who was really, really generous and is the only reason that Mount Rainier Phoenix exists, but the operation was always run on a shoestring. So she's just, um, you know, she's been patched and cobbled together, and um, I don't know when, when or if she's ever really had a like totally full overhaul. You know, of course we've done like she's had 1472s, but um, you know she needs she needs boiler work. Is all of the patches in the boiler are you know it's it's just to a point that you can only patch things so many times and her running gear is tired um she's just she's worn out um and i think that's probably a combination of how she was run um logging locomotives just i mean logging operations are so different than um a lot of other railroads you know for the most part they're short lines you may do um, you weren't working in optimal conditions, um, and a lot of the repair work was just, um, like bootstrapping, you know, uh, logging operations remind me a lot of, like, farming, like old school farming, where you just keep everything running as long as you possibly can, um, with what, whatever you have on site, and I think that, that has probably characterized, uh, the 17th entire existence. Ran hard, put away wet, a little bit of oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, because yeah. Rowdy was your chief mechanical officer, Rowdy Pierce was saying in your latest video too how the the trailing truck also has uh, is some issues mm -hmm. because of how wide it has to swing. Something along those lines, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Um, I think you're the one to talk to you about that. Yeah. Um, I can I can't give an articulate assessment. But um, yeah, it would I mean it makes sense as of how people think of logging railroads and they think of the Trinity, your climax, your Shea, mm -hmm. or it, yeah, on in your neck of the woods, the Willamette as well, um, and the Heisler, uh, which were, but something like this, it does give you more speed. Um, but at that cost of having that rigid frame and having to account for that rigid frame. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's not something I really, I don't know, in, until kind of discovering the the 282 ST, the Nana Minaret, uh, the only thing I ever knew about logging was Shays, Climaxes, and Heislers. And the Willamette, like I had no idea that there were 
rod engines. I didn't know about any of the Wirehauser stuff, and I mean that that's really yeah. cool. All their big articulated. Like that wasn't yeah, what came to like, mind for me. Towards the end of the twenties, especially for like me and where my interests lie, and you know, and that's right along with um, the seventeen is when some of the patents started to expire, you know, on engines and some of the technology that these other companies came in and um, you know, I, they didn't reinvent the wheel, but they said, hey, Porter does this really well or which, whichever company, you know. Um, so we're going to take that little piece from them and then, hey, we like this part of the shade, so then, you know, we're going to, we're going to take that. Um, and you ended up with some sort of funky locomotives, um, like the 17, where I think there was a lot of experimentation happening um, at the at the end of that decade, and, um, you know, the depression hit, and then diesels came, came into play, so, um, you know, it's like in that alternate universe, like, what, what if the depression hadn't hit so hard, and um, what if the logging industry had sort of remained strong through those times? Is what would have, you know, I think five or six more years of innovation would have been absolutely fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it was, I don't know, like thinking about like how Wire, how, or I guess Rainier ended up with everything in the end, mm-hmm. running those big articulated into what, 59, 61? And yeah, like, I mean, it's like, you're like you're still running something that was built in the teens and 20s and milking mm-hmm. every last penny out of it um oh yeah i don't know i, mean, I think i think west coast logging is cooler area. yeah yeah i mean there's there's old timers in the area that remember running the engines still that is um, and that's very cool most of the original volunteers at mount rainier were is you know they essentially had like a 20-year break from steam engines and then tom murray you know said, hey, these things are rusting out in the woods. I want something to do with them. And these guys were all still around. Um, um, yeah, no, it's, and, it's crazy. Um, let's talk about Tom a little bit. Uh, yeah. In the, um, because he is a, a very, very cheap reason that, that Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad exists. Where does he come into the picture uh, in terms of trying to to save this equipment, since you didn't mention his name with the 17, it sounds like he kind of, he was a key player, but he also sort of attracted other players to the mix to be able to form this organization. Yeah, I mean, um, Mount Rainier Phoenix really started in 1980 because of Tom, um, which in terms of heritage rail operations is fairly early. Um, you know, I think if you look at a lot of other operations, it was sort of the, the mid to late 80s through the early 90s mm-hmm. um, that a lot of these nonprofits formed. Um, and, you know, Tom, Tom's family, Tom owned uh, Murray Pacific, um, a logging company, and he grew up around the equipment and he just, he loved it. Uh, so he would acquire it and then eventually he needed um, somewhere to put it and his brother-in-law was George Warehouser um, and Warehouser was sort of in the process of abandoning the line um, or a lot of sections were out of disuse so he had this parcel in mineral and said yeah I mean Tom if you want that go for it <laughs> and um, that's where Tom started stockpiling locomotives, and then, you know, other people um, said, you know, hey, I have this engine, I need, you know, I want to restore it, I, I need somewhere for it, you know, to put it and keep it safe, and, um, you know, and I uh, wasn't around then, I wasn't alive, um, but, you know, I, I talk about Rowdy a lot, because he's our rail ops manager, and he... Um, is my age. We were both 34. Um, but he grew up around the railroad and he remembers being there when he was like five or six years old watching um, some of the old heads, you know, like Blackie Mosier switching. And he's like, they would just 
switched the entire yard, you know, and like there were never radios. They did it all with hand signals, and it was so efficient. Uh, and he's if like, I and may, it wasn't. If I may interrupt, yeah. uh, Nick, you got five cars to stop. Yep, working on that. Um, but, you know, it was like, it wasn't until I was older that I realized that this is what they'd done their entire working life. Um, so I think Mineral is really, um, even though it's an, only like an hour and a half from Seattle, it is backwoodsy. Um, so I think you just, it's sort of amazing that you had Tom and this piece of property and these locomotives that had all sat outside for 20, 30 years, um, turning into piles of rust, but you still had a lot of talent around um, the area, even after the mills closed. Uh, it, it's a, such a unique history. Um, though not, I, don't know, I guess almost like the classic story of like tourist railroads in that era of like, hey, I, I, I bought some stuff. I need a place to put it. And yeah, I, I want to play with it. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's, um, you know, like coming from New York and Adirondack, I mean, arguably, um, which I, I was executive director of Adirondack Phoenix Railroad for many a year. And, um, you know, that line was built as a tourist line from the start. Um, oh, you know, yeah. For, and it was all like the sort of the glitz and grit and glamour of railroading and, you know, the Vanderbilt going to the great camps and um, doing research on logging and on this railroad and logging railroads is so entirely different because the only written records are like newspaper articles where like someone died or someone lost a leg or like one mill closed and all the workers went over to you know another or a different logging camp and um doing research is so much different um than it is uh for a lot of railroads like on the east coast yeah i found that it's hard to find stuff on a lot of the West Coast logging. There's just nothing out there. And if you do find it, it it's just like a newspaper clipping or a, a photo from yeah. the, the local town crier. It was absolutely the Wild West. And, like, you know, I think the Wild West, um, having grown up on the East Coast, I always think of the Gold Rush. Um, but all of those things, like, about Gold Rush towns and, like, you know, like, shanty camps being popped up and, like, the conditions, I mean, that's a hundred percent log camps and logging railroads um and you know it was the you know seattle right has amazon and starbucks and microsoft now but that's what these logging companies were you know at the turn of the century um you know they were the giant titan corporations at the time all right and uh, as you've been doing line, nick thank you and as um, you've been doing the research how much uh, how much overlap do you find in terms of the the sort of the corporate culture or, or the the flavor of of the the working environment? How how similar are they are? How do do they kind of each have their own personality uh, in terms of the characteristics that made that company or that environment that company or that environment? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that I've found, and there would, um, you know, some of the old timers would probably argue, <laughs> argue that point. But like when you read news articles, or if you're lucky enough to find diary entries, um, I mean, it's, it's log camps. Um, for those who don't know, and probably most people on the same do, are essentially entire little towns that would be brought in by rail um you know so you had your cabins and your uh mess hall and maybe a chapel if you know the company thought that was important um would all be brought in and rail and they would be there for as long as it took to log that section of um in that acreage and you know then they would move on um, but the working conditions were atrocious for the most part, as I'm sure you can all imagine. And a lot of times workers were paid in strip pay, so they'd be, you know, 
paid in money that could only be used in the company store or in the log camp. So um, it was hard to build any security or savings, right? You know, the, um, the company owned where you lived, right? The company was responsible if you had a family, which is probably pretty rare, and the company housed your family. Mm -hmm. So um, when workers would be really unhappy there wasn't a whole lot of recourse it was hard to up and leave but what you could do is just go to another log camp or you know the next one over or the next company and i think that there was a lot of movement between camps um and you know a lot of the stories are you know there was a lot of movement based on how good the food was and that was one of the best recruiting strategies was to have better food so usually the head chef was the highest paid person in the camp or um i don't know what your audience is but the um most attractive women that were available for service uh well um, <laughs> if i may interrupt we got some switching moves to do up here uh nick mm -hmm. uh so uh Bring her ahead five cars to a stop. Two. One more car. Keep her coming half. Ten. Five. Anywhere in there. All right, back them up. Three. So uh, we're uh, we're dropping the caboose so that way it's on the correct side of the train for the shove up the next uh to the next log camp. Uh, for anyone out there wondering what the heck we're doing. Makes sense to me. Yeah, you know, bit of a switching fun. Uh, one car. Eh, anywhere in there, if you can get her stopped. Oh, I'm good. All right, come on, little roll. There you go. All right, are you uh, using the old uh, push and shove method? Uh, of the... The... It needs a little help overcoming the. Uh... Uh, I oh, see. oh, you were too close. It just bounced off you. Oh. Uh, yeah, roll, roll back another uh, car length. It's those pesky, uh, the foul points that, you know, really get you. Yeah, try that. All right. But I, I'm, I, I'm really excited for the work that you're going to be doing as, and you, yeah, I'd love to hear you talk more about this. Uh, as obviously you're bringing the trains back, you're bringing back the excursion experience, but also this this history and cultural center that you're developing, because logging history is one of these things I've had an awareness of, but there's never been anything out there that's kind of shouted. Here is here's something that really encapsulate the feel uh, that the texture of the uh what that was that history was and it seems like that's something that's really important to the relaunch of what you're developing yeah i mean i think good solid attempts have been made um and i think that the just sort of the way that history is told and the way that museums operate has changed so much in the last 30 years even and um you know, it's a, like, obviously we're all rail fans and dedicate our lives to heritage rail. So it is about the glorification of the locomotives and just how cool is the engineering and how cool is the machinery, you know, and that's something that um, probably Matt Radier between Rowdy and I uh, and everything, you know, our YouTube channel and everything we're putting out on social media, we complain about our engines a lot because they're, you know, they're pesky and they're expensive and they need a lot of work, but um, we love them. But I think that so much of um, 
the story that's been told really glorifies, you know, like how how tough the people were that worked in the logging camps. And, you know, this is the machinery that um, allowed all of that work to happen. But I think a lot of the human element is lost um, and what that day-to-day -day life looks like is lost. Um, and obviously, like, being a woman in railroading, I'm like, okay. But it wasn't just all men, was it? Like, there were women there. Mm -hmm. And then you sort yeah, of start... Um, and then you sort of start digging in, and you're like, oh, there w were women there, and maybe those aren't the, like, nicest stories to tell, and maybe that's why the stories weren't told. Um, and that, and that sort of is we're researching and, you know, obviously this, this museum project and, you know, the history interpretation is going to be something that takes a lot of time. Um, this isn't going to be something that happens, you know, in six months or in a year. Um, but we're finding so, like, so many interesting things out about, like, the, Japanese American population and you know how, how significant the Japanese logging population was um, in the area particularly after uh, they were driven out of Seattle and Tacoma and Portland in a lot of situations um, you know a lot of Japanese communities wound up in these rural areas looking for work and uh, the logging camps were largely integrated um, which is something that maybe a lot of folks wouldn't expect or think of um so you know and obviously like that research is just so hard to do because so, so many of the stories weren't told um uh we didn't we weren't quick enough nick this is fun to watch and where else can you do flying switches but a video game <laughs> i'm just chilling on top of a locomotive like i you don't get to do that anymore you did that's why every chance I have where I can like ride the switching steps up front, I always take. Like any chance I have where like I can do this move by like pr doing it like the quote unquote right way, or I can do a flying <laughs> switch. I will take the flying switch a hundred percent of the time because it's like what I'm never gonna get to do a flying switch. I mean, I've, I know, like, when I was first like walking around the game, I was like you know walking, giving myself thirty feet clearance behind the like engine and the you know the cars when I was walking around and. It was like, how do I, I can't walk in the gate, so like walking on the side of the track, and I'm like, wait, Bevan, this is a game. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm not going to get in trouble. Shove her ahead a bit in there, Nick. We'll, uh, we'll get a better run at this. Sounds good. Uh, two cars. Well, it's something that, um, actually my mom had picked up on this from looking at photos in uh, Lee Rainey's a uh, book on the East Broadtop, but I've I've seen so many login photos of this too, where and, and in railroading in general, but login photos in particular of these women posed on steam locomotives out in the middle of nowhere, uh, and right. and it's always <laughs> kind of treated as this sort of Far side enough. thing, and and we see it, but it's like I, I want to like. I want somebody to explore that story more of like the, these. I'm, I'm tempted to say random women, but of course they had reason for being there. Yeah. It's just what was that? Re like were they just like the significant others or spouses or yeah. of, uh, of the loggers who are like, hey, go in there and, and <laughs> go in there yeah. and get in the photo with the equipment kind of thing. Exactly. Um, and, you know, it's, we've got a few volunteers who are just, um, like, really, really, really great researchers um, and who are exploring all of these, you know... Run harder, harder, problems. harder. We need to get over the hill. All right. Go. It was, it's funny because this is, like, when we're discussing which locomotives that we need to put money into next after the 70, this is, this is our problem. With a seventeen. <laughs> exactly yes, what yes. we, we just are did. Yeah, we are demonstrating why your seventeen has uh, some kinks to be worked out at this stage. <laughs> uh, Hard couple there. Yeah, just just a little bit. 
Uh, that's uh, that's a fender bender. But I, I totally agree with your your approach of. Um... All right. Well, uh, you can run ahead. This will this will stop itself. Um, but I agree with your approach to to bring up the the recently passed uh, Sainer Gordon Lightfoot. I, I think one of the things that makes his Canadian Railroad trilogy dawn so tremendous is because it encapsulates all these different elements of that history. You have the the celebration of this national achievement, mm -hmm. all the excitement of that, and then this center section that's sort of taking the perspective of uh, a navi who would have actually had to been doing the hard work to build the railroad and to me what you're embarking on doesn't take away from the glitz and glamour of the technology it enriches it because it gives it a context it it, it gives more of an environment to what how was this thing treated where did it run and what was that whole atmosphere like and the the stories behind it the stories behind the people that ran it there's so much to be unearthed and explored there yeah and i mean like you know i to a degree i think if you just glorify it all you do a disservice to the people that you're actually trying to honor um you know because i mean some of the, like, I've got little tidbits of facts that we've learned, you know, but it's like some of the first unions on the West Coast um, formed in lumber mills and log camps. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that wasn't done without a fight, you know, so when, when you've got workers that are mobilizing and um, there's a reason for it, you know, especially back in the day, um, you know, and examining like, okay, well, what were the, what were the circumstances that led to you know that action and the risk that they incurred um you know and it's, that's what we've been um i've got uh, one researcher nick you gotta bonk back yeah. into it i hit the coupler uh roll ahead then bonk back uh, okay. There we go. It's hard tying up Glen hands when you're balancing on a bridge. Truly, <laughs> uh, we're encapsulating the wild, wild west spirit of railroading today. Yes, and uh, yeah, well, right. uh, you're you're clear to shove up the hill. <laughs> JV says, and CJ is dead. Uh. <laughs> Honestly, like I get a little immersed sometimes, and like when I fall off like that, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, no, I'm not gonna die. <laughs> I get right. Um, that's what I'm like. Well, at least no one's losing a leg today, so that's cool. I one of my first times playing this, I got jump scared. I was standing in the gauge and got jump scared by a train, and like actually screamed out loud, like, ha ha, like, oh, right, yeah, one computer of, screen. <laughs> one of my poor, poor volunteers was. Um, is I put a little volunteer call out on one of our weekly roundups that was like, hey, I haven't played a video game since the 90s. Um, I need to talk to someone. I need like an emotional support gamer right now to show me what to do. Um, and yeah, so one of our volunteers, Justin, is like, okay, showing me like how to do things on a, on a different um, game. And I was like, what? But this isn't safe. Like, what, what, where, 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 like, I need to be, you know, I don't know, whatever it was I was doing. I can't just jump off and have this equipment, like, you know, looking around. <laughs> it, it, it. <laughs> I mean, it's good that you have that ingrained into your mind, because ordinarily that is the attitude to have. This is the exception to the it, rule. It really is the <laughs> exception to the rule of it is okay to get run over by a train. Or walk in the gauge, or stand on the roof of a, a not a minaret. <laughs> the not a minaret. Uh, Even if you're volunteers. Oh, right, right, Casey. I was gonna say we got a, a couple, uh, one or two chat questions I wanted to hit up real quick. Go for it. Um, 
So we had a chat from Davies wanting to know what the limiting factor of four cars uh, demand from the industries. Uh, only a certain number of cars were waybilled. That's how many cars they wanted. That's how many cars we bring up. Um, and vice versa back down. Uh, another question. Uh, I lost where it was, but someone wanted to know why we were bringing a gun with us. Um, we were bringing a gun with us because a uh, little bit of movie magic. Um, but, uh, you know, the uh, the second log camp requested material, so we're bringing some material up in the gun for them. Uh, it's got some, uh, I think, some riprap in it that they wanted. But uh, that's, that is the reasoning behind. And pay no attention to the poly bridge here. Something, the, something, the, something, Alpha. The the movie uh, being referenced in that movie magic is, of course, Gone with the Wind. Oh, 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 oh. oh that was it tonight, <laughs> folks. We're done. <laughs> no, we're just getting warmed up. This but is true. That, that, you know, <laughs> that, that, that was the, the first one that came to me. Um, but, but stay tuned for more great puns coming along the way. Uh, we, we have many planned. Yes. Not planned. So, so speaking of your wonderful volunteers, Beth, and it, you alluded to the fact that they could help you get connected with your, your video gaming needs, which is great. But even more importantly, they are getting Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad back up and running. Uh, it sounds from what you've been posting on Facebook like you've had some really good turnout at your volunteer weekends. What are the types of things that they're doing? They're busy. Um, I'm just so sick and proud of our volunteers. Like, our, our volunteers are the best. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, like, there's a lot of prep work that goes into the volunteer weekends, but um, I leave feeling good, which I think for a lot of folks in the Heritage Railroad world, you know, it's like saying, oh my gosh, we're going we're gonna to prep a work weekend every single weekend, and feed the volunteers and you know stage everything and have all the tools ready and all of that like it's work but like these i mean for the most part these guys are just um incredible um so most of uh, we have um a pretty broad mix of volunteers we launched our volunteer call in let's see at the end of january and we've had about a hundred people sign up uh, that a given time, which I think is pretty darn cool, considering that is um, a pretty short time frame. Um, and it's a it's a mix where we still got a few of sort of the the old hats around um, who are there to advise. We've got some pretty. I mean, we have some industry folks who work for short lines. Um, you know that that are. Their full-time job is railroading, and it's really, really cool. I'll shout out Scott Gordon and Andy Rose for any folks in the industry who, who know them. But, you know, they both work for Tacoma Rail, but they got their start at Mount Rainier um, a minute ago, not terribly long ago. But um, I think they're sort of in this. Uh, they're still relatively. Yeah, see what they need to. We're going to have a three cars to stop your neck. Uh, and uh, we have a question from Cheeky Bus Driver wanting to know who your favorite volunteer is, Bethann. Uh, I'm going to go... Oh, Cheeky Bus... Is that Andy? Who am I supposed to say? Who's listening? It's, it's one of them, isn't it? The, the I, I would assume is... so. <laughs> you, you don't know. Uh, I think anywhere I know, in there is good. I don't Nick. know which one. I don't know which one that is, but whoever that is is totally my favorite. Well, there you have it, cheeky oh. bus driver. You're the favorite. Uh, back him <laughs> up three cars there. Uh, one and I. I got stuck on a ladder. But yeah, that's what we just uh, ran a little volunteer report, and I think it's like 85, 86 percent of our volunteer hours so far have been donated by folks under 35 and for the wow. most part in their 20s um and most of them don't have any railroad experience or very little so um like andy and scott who i was picking on you know like they One got car. their start at mount rainier half a car and they're able to far enough it's Ooh, they're able it, to it's okay it's, it's uh 
this is about how switching goes. Uh, it's uh, always getting interrupted by uh, car counts. That's all good. All right. I'm, I'm, what you can't see is me sitting here being like hand uh, signals. Nick, can like... you go your other forward? <laughs> I heard forward. I hear forward, I go forward. Alright, kick him. Are we operating under, like, G-Core? What are we doing here? Uh, so, the rulebook we came up with was based on standard code, so it's old timetable and train order. I have a soft spot right. for it, that's the rulebook I grew up on. Um, <laughs> you actually, uh, you know some of the people that I know. Uh, I grew up, um, with, uh, Mr. Matthews and Mr. Chardreau. Uh, uh, down in Jersey. Uh, 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 yeah, Jersey Dawn. Um, <laughs> so uh, I grew up learning a standard code from them, and yeah, uh, we stopped using that book down there. So I, uh, I decided to keep it alive in game because I, I like those kinds of rules. That's cool. All right, next so we'll. Uh, I'm still working on my switch to G core. It's not natural for me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I've heard about going from like NORAC to G Core. It's not a very natural transition. They make fun of me every time I start doing hand signals because I always do the wrong one first, and then I'm like, ah. Oh my god, I have had that conversation with some West Coast friends of like, what? Why are you doing hand signals wrong? <laughs> All right, uh, Nick, yeah. let's drop this hack over one track, then we'll come grab the logs and dump them on top of the hack. Now, where are these volunteers based out of? Because you guys are kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Are yeah. these folks from Seattle and Tacoma? Yeah, for the most part, our volunteers, I would say our volunteers on average have an hour drive to get there at least. Um, and it's just been such a cool situation because we've got so many folks that don't, like I said, don't have railroad experience that are getting to learn from folks that do. And I had this, like, the warmest, fuzziest moment last weekend when I showed up and they had already assigned all of their job duties for the week, all, like, weekend all on their own. They'd have their safety meetings. And then one of them came and was like, hey, I need your keys. And I'm like, uh, okay, why? Well, we got to put blue flags up, dude. And I was like, oh, yeah, yes, you do. Good job. Well, that warms my heart. Um, and it was like, it, it was the dorkiest, like, warm fuzzy. But, like, I got misty-eyed and um, I'm pregnant, so it doesn't take a lot to make me cry right now. Um, so, yeah, it was just, like, the best freaking moment when they just did it all themselves and they're learning and they're studying g core and they're like um they're learning how to do like a C or tns on the cars and um body work and carpentry and they're they take out the garbage at the end of the day without being asked to um like they're just so thick and cool it's worth getting misty eyed over because railroading at its best great Tourist, it's teamwork. It's mm -hmm. people coming together and recognizing that there's a larger task to be accomplished. And especially in preservation, knowing that that you, that you as, I mean, you, Bethan, are, are at the head of this ship, but you as a volunteer are, are doing work that makes a difference, gives you motivation to be looking out for the smaller details and, and doing what you can to contribute to the overall project no matter how big or yeah. small we think of the big things like restore the steam locomotive and run it on the main line but taking out the trash somebody's got to do it yeah I mean, and, and and it's me right <laughs> or it's riot or it's rowdy you know and i think for the past few years it's been um rowdy bird and i you know for the folks that follow the youtube and the facebook um talking Which... about like okay what would we do if if we got control of this thing what would we do uh -huh. and a, a slight plug there if you guys haven't checked out their website their youtube their facebook if you go exclamation mark i want to do it here mount rainier scenic railroad 
it will bring you to their website and you can find all of their social medias yes um which you should yeah. definitely do and again i'm only slightly biased because i'm editing the vlogs <laughs> we're super biased that anything they very biased to gold so um it's not really a, sh a shout out and a plug for us it's a, it's a plug for for nick <laughs> <laughs> oh but you guys make it fun honestly i that's the thing i i enjoyed the like last fall i i worked with you guys to create the trailer and that was the the sort of the, the super polished super veneered look at this <laughs> magnificent thing coming back and i like that what we're creating with the vlogs is is, is much more of a a much more kind of stripped down kind of here's what's going on on the ground level you're talking to the audience like real people and yeah sharing good news but not like just endless sugar coating not endless everything is awesome but really getting into this is what it takes to restart a tourist railroad because it is a lot of hard work yeah That's the what, vlogs lot are of... so cool they're like one of my favorite <laughs> things oh damn you, you gotta pull ahead and slam back in i accidentally popped the coupler man those couplers are loose today all right and back them up <laughs> it's been a the vlog like we had a, a you know sort of a like who do we want to be and what messages do we want to put out there talks um really you know like in november and december and um you know when it was just the the few of us and i don't think bird and rowdy were on payroll yet um you know they were volunteering time um and you know saying like okay but what do we actually have to hide you know like we're maybe idiotically trying to get this railroad running again maybe it's overly ambitious like we've got 50 grand in a bank account and we're going to try and open a railroad like this is um on paper this is dumb like we're trying to make something profitable like with machines that were all taken out of service for not being profitable um but hey if we're going to do it then let's show people what it's actually going to be like why why would we you know, why would we sugarcoat it? Why would we hide things? We care about the industry. We care about preservation. And I think so often you see the, like, the shiny glorification of it. You know, when people get a new piece of equipment or they get something back in service, but they don't see what it takes to get there. Um, so we sort of made a conscious decision to just put it all out there. Uh, and, it, and the response has been pretty okay so far. No, knock on wood. The operational thing? Let's stop before we get to that big bridge at the bottom of the hill, Nick. Uh, I think we're going to have to do some funky flying switching moves down there. Gotcha. Um, but no, the vlogs, are, the vlogs are super cool for that. Cause like, I don't know, like, I like being able to see like the reopening of the line. That's cool, but like also a little bit of the inside thinking and uh, the intelligent use of social media as a tourist railroad to do something with it? I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's pretty cool. It's different. It's unique. It's It appeals to a younger audience rather than like the typical run railroad Facebook page um, that's occasionally just like an event post. Yeah. Here's a steam engine. We're, we're pretty we, I mean, I guess I'm the only one that does it, but it's, it's pretty tongue-in-cheek for the most part um but yeah i don't you know we don't have we don't have a giant corporate structure you know like backing us we don't have benefactors at this point like we're sort of doing this wild west thing like 2.0 right now in 2023 with this like motley group of you know four of us five of us on staff and a whole bunch of volunteers Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of like where um, history is repeating. <laughs> and I kept having people, uh, Nick included, saying, hey, you are recording this, right? Like, you're, you're writing things down, you're taking photos, you're taking videos as you do this. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be the story. Like, I am not the story. Um, like, it's about all of these other people. Um, and I truly, like, I don't, I am not the story, but there are um, I think it was Nick that um, said to me, like, but the volunteers and the people working on things are part of the history. 
and then um, I don't know that just that stuck with me. Uh, so it's I do recall everyone saying, else everyone else everyone else won. <laughs> I do, I do recall saying that, and the the reason yeah that stuck I, I with me. Well, I'm glad that it has, and for me, the reason that I I know it's true is because I'm seeing it across the tourist railroad industry as a whole is that i mean it, it's admirable uh that that you're not looking to hug the spotlight and not making it all about you personally um at, but i think honestly sometimes the best leaders are the ones that are saying it, it's not about me because they recognize the larger picture that said because you are leading the endeavor because uh, I saw this too with Brad Esposito at uh, the East Broadtop Railroad, uh, is that I, Brad is a very down-to-earth guy, very much not a look at me, I, I, I need attention kind of guy, but because he is the general manager there, uh, he inevitably is now becoming part of this history. Uh, and that's that's what you're doing at, at Mount Rainier as well. And, and all of us, when whenever we're participating in a tourist railroad it doesn't matter how big or small our contribution is by contributing we are contrib we are we are becoming part of that history the more we contribute the more prominent our role in that history becomes yeah yeah i mean it's just like i look but it's, i've been working on this business plan for i don't know since we shut down well since before we were shut down in 2020 and it's just it's been floating around in my brain even when i didn't think it was ever coming back and um i feel like i'm in such a selfish place where i was like i wanted to do this i feel like i need to see it through um mm -hmm. i want this to happen i want to make it a success and that feels really selfish to me because um like I mean, hell, like, my husband is home with our our son and is, like, understands when I'm working 65-hour weeks and doesn't complain about it. And, um, like, how freaking lucky is that? And, like, when we're talking about needing to get um, folks qualified, because there are only four of us qualified to run in the line right now, we need to get everyone, like, recertified and through g Core and all of that again, because... Um, we went from, hey, we're not running trains until 2025 to, eh, let's run them this summer, it'll be cool, um, which is a different story. And um, I believe it's my favorite volunteer, according to this thread, uh, was like, hey, yeah, I, I understand that I need to put in however many hours. Um, you're going to be seven or eight months pregnant. So if I'll just, whenever you're a conductor, I'll sign up so that you don't have to lift heavy crap. Um, you know, uh, and Nick, can you just, take a recharge? It's cool, and it's a selfish like I. I feel like there are so many people that um sort of enable me to do this thing that I I want to do. All right, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we go down, we fly those um empty log cars. Uh, down onto the main past us. Mm -hmm. Then we um, pull in, run around the loaded stuff. Kick that down the tail we just came down. Pull the other stuff back in. Oh, we gotta do a run around still. I, I have an idea of what we're gonna do. Um, well, I, I have an idea. I'm not going to explain it because I don't think I can word it out. Don't, don't worry. But just I've, tell I've, me. I've, just okay. Yeah, you tell me what you got to do in this song. I am living my like inner breakman heaven right now. Like I, I run. Running's fun. Firing's fun. Shoveling coal's fun. I I love when I get a switch. I I love when I get a switching puzzle with drilling out the yard or something. Is that is, is that your happy railroad place? My happy railroad place is being a brakeman. I love running. Don't get me wrong. Um proud to run i'm proud of all the hard work that i put into it um and i was able to i was able to get to where i am yeah um, you were <laughs> and i am i am excited i get the honor of um 
first day of the season on Saturday. Being uh, getting to pull the first uh, train of the regular season, so I am very excited for that. Yeah, I can um, that awesome, dude. That. You know? Yeah. Um. But like, Breakman's my happy place. Breakman is absolutely my happy place. I love. I love getting the switchman. I, I love the switcher puzzle. Um, I I don't get to nearly do enough of it anymore. Like I still have like my old like vest that way my radio would be strapped to my chest with like the little pocket for my switch list like i still have all of that it still lives in my grip and i think i've used it like (laughs) twice in the last like three years yeah um but breakman's my happy place maintenance away is mine god bless maintenance away is mine so Uh. so your 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 happy place is at a high rail my happy place, yeah, my happy place is in a high rail, preferably in the most remote section of the rail that I can find. I feel like that needs to be a t-shirt. My happy place is a high rail. Not putting the high, I just want to clarify, with our high rail, if you look at the YouTube, it is not the putting it on the track part. It is the getting to. <laughs> no, I, I, I cut the, right. uh, the amount of attempts for clarity on that. Run like hell, Nick. Yeah. We, we gotta beat up 17 here. Okay, beating up 17. <laughs> I think we did it this time. I think we successfully beat her up. I think we did. Alright, uh, you could start. run ahead to run around those log cars. Uh, I'll do. And I'm going to dump this so that way it doesn't roll all the way down the hill. Just most of the way down the hill. Good plan. So, as you mentioned there, part of your uh, plan to uh, getting back into operation involves you operating on not your own tracks, which is really some out of the box thinking there. You're you're partnering with your friends in Chehalis to make that mm-hmm. happen. Yes, that's I am. When I heard that, like, because like this, this stream had already been announced, and then that news came out, and I was in a different Discord with other friends, and they're like, "Hey, you know Bethan? Uh-huh. Is this true?" And I'm like, "I'm not. I'm not texting her to see if this is true." I mean, everyone else did. <laughs> that's, that's why I didn't text you. I'm like, like it's probably well, I a didn't, lot of... the, Yeah, the news, um, the news leaked uh, quite a bit earlier than we thought it was going to, and I was, it was like 8:30 at night, and um, I don't know. I was just hanging out with my husband after Kiddo went to bed, and my phone started blowing up, and I was like, uh oh. That's what never happened? a good sign. Um, but yeah, no, we, um, perhaps, oh, I mean, it's, we're like a, we are a month away from launching our rail cycles, which um, my brother-in-law and I designed, and we are maybe six weeks from beginning tourist train operations, and I, um, it is ambitious and perhaps overly ambitious. And what I what I tell folks is like it's either going to be really cool by the end of the year, or uh, we're going to fall flat on our faces. Um, hopefully, it ends up being really really cool. Um, but you know, we had some really awesome turnout from the volunteers, and. Um, before I was pregnant, Rowdy and I were, uh, which is how we got into the situation to begin with, but God, we were um, testing a new single malt, uh, <laughs> you know, and we're sort of talking about, well, you know, like, are we really that far off from being able to run run trains, like, equipment-wise? And, you know, it's probably anyone that's been around a railroad. You start having these hypothetical conversations about, you know, what would be cool? Oh, if I had a nickel. Yeah, and it was absolutely one of those, except uh, with liquid aid. Um, 
you know, Rowdy was like, well, we can get the 70 up and running. Like, that's not going to take that much. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not running those Tacoma rail cars in the summer. Like, so we'd have to get the 900 series cars back and running. And then, um, you know, like, well, we can't afford the bridge repairs right now. There's no way we're going to make that happen. We're like, well, so let's start talking to, like, some of our neighbors. They've got tracks. You know, and then we, we went through and said, okay, well, what's Tacoma Rail doing? What's Rainier Rail doing? And then we went, wait, hold on. The Hellas isn't running. They just got all this FEMA money, and they've been, you know, doing massive, like, track work. Um, and I didn't know what the reception was going to be, but uh, I sent an email to Mary Kay, their president, and said, hey, um, got a sort of crazy idea. I think it was, like, February or March. It's February, but the first time like we met, um, it was like, hey, you know, like sort of crazy idea here. Um, and it wasn't really March until like we presented it to her board, so all of two months ago. Um, like, how do you feel wow. about us bringing our toys to your railroad and playing? And I think that's exactly how I pitched it. Uh, three cars um, to a hook. Two cars, one car, half a car, ten feet, five feet, bang. Making well, sure one... you get the full logging experience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm over here uh, clutching my office chair. Like, oh god, oh god, oh god. Alright, take your ahead. Uh, here, park myself up here. Uh, it, that was it's it's really cool news too. Um, how are you guys getting there? Is kind of my question. Are you trucking stuff over? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. Um, no, we are firing up the seventy. You know, taking her on half a dozen test rides and then taking her on a hundred mile test ride, pulling all of our equipment down to Sahara. Because there's, there's nothing like being overly ambitious. Um, I've never fired oil, um, but I, I can learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, and it's, um, it's uh, not necessarily a simple move. Um, our, we have a 42-year lease on our section of railroad that we operate on that we're working on um, exercising our buyout option. Um, but that's with Tacoma Rail, which is a municipal-owned railroad, which I think is one or two in the country. But they just sold a nice chunk of their line to Rainier Rail, which is a short line operator. Hmm. So we haven't been sure when that sale was going to go through. Um, and then Rainier Rail owns um, the other spur, so we've got to, you know, travel from where we are now up to Fredericton and then down and over to Chehalis. So we've been uh, coordinating with Tacoma Rail, Rainier Rail, and CCRM um, on at least 30 miles, maybe 20 miles, 24 miles of track. Um, that hasn't been operational in a long time. It's awesome to hear that kind of like inner work. That, wow, I just forgot the word. Like the, the cooperation. Yeah. Amongst yeah, so many different I mean, interorganizations. Yeah. Oh my god. And it's been um. Yeah, it's just been a series of me like pressing send on an email and then like rocking back and forth a little bit, going, "Oh god, oh god, what are they gonna say?" <laughs> Um, you know, and then, you know, we've met with them and they've been really great and really receptive and, you know, we've talked a little bit about like, hey, this is our safety plan, this is our training, this is what we're doing, you know, this is what we're looking at and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, sounds like you guys are thinking about it, that sounds really good and everyone's been, um, All right, far enough, Nick. super receptive, which it really, it would have only taken one person saying like, hey, this is risky, like, let's not. Including, like, including my board. The fact that you're, uh, I mean, it's amazing that your board was just, yes. 
to the idea like that. I mean, it was a whole, whole bunch of discussion, but like, I think it was our March board meeting. I was like, hey, so funny idea. What March board think? meeting that leaked, what, a week and a half ago? Yeah. My God. That's insane. <laughs> but, yep. And then, know. of course, you know, like our plan is then to launch Real Cycle. Um, and, you know, like the real bikes, we have one prototype. I just got kicked out of the game. How did that happen? Oh, no. Oh, we'll save in case something happens. If it's not us. Um, working on coming back in. Um, oh, hey, there we are. All right, far enough. Back him up, Nick. What happens if I just stand on the gauge? Uh, uh, here, I'll, I'll stand. I'll stand with you. Let's do this. <laughs> it's a little bit terrifying. Here, we'll we'll make it like even more real. It feels a little wrong, right? Uh, everything wrong. inside of me is saying move. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, you phased through it. I'm getting shoved. Wait, I am too. What? I'm Where moving. are you? Oh, you're inside. I, I don't know. You're inside I'm the. No, I'm you, not... You're next to the am firebox. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> oh my. Okay, there. I jumped. I, I jumped. Oh, I, there we I'm go. A, oh, okay, I'm in the cab apparently, or not. Okay. I'm. Was... I'm gonna. I'm gonna stand over here. Oh my. Y'all have it a crazy time, Rad. By people. We we really are. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to figure out how the hell we're gonna do this. Are we? Wouldn't uh... it have made more sense to put the caboose on the? on the trestle, dove the log cars back, and then put the caboose on with it? Oh uh, now I gotta oh pull these God. things in. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, um, ha 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 ha. Alright, yes, we'll grab these cars, we'll pull them in. I don't know, you think we're good enough to fl How much of a running start can you get? Very. Okay, we're gonna fly these in, <laughs> and re uh, I guess this is reasons why logging engines are clapped out 101. Uh, <laughs> 15 feet, 10 feet, five feet, two foot. I think we're gonna we're, we're gonna like trademark that. Not renew scenic railroad clapped out logging engines. Yes. There's a super cut to be done of Rowdy uh, doing the, the, the tour and saying, this edge is clapped at, that edge is clapped at. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me know you're ready. Uh, I'm not ready. Just highball. Off we go. If this works successfully, and I don't have to use dev tools to spawn something. I'm ready. We're gonna have a two-year-old in the background of this for a little bit. Oh, I made that cut too early. I so made that cut too early. Um. We can do it though. We can. I'm also looking at. I'm also trying to be cognizant of the time. Oh, that's true. That is a thing. Uh, well, since I don't want to do it on stream, would you like to go behind these cars and spawn something to shove them, to keep shoving them with? Sure. Uh... Well, you know, you try, you fail. It's all great. Let's see what Actually, we get. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it our resident spawner to spawn in. <laughs> it, 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 shall we go with another not a minaret? I think we go with no, another not a minaret. Trinzy Builder is asking us to spawn in 080. I would if there was one in the game, but there's not. So we'll go with another not a minaret. Oh, sorry. I'm on top of the log. That's an okay place to be. I didn't I think know that's that fine. I could do that. Okay. 
Okay, I've messaged our resident spawner to, to uh, work his magic. And Rudy! Yeah. We need a steam engine. So. Well, now's as good a time of any. Uh, we always like to recommend a book every stream. And uh, I think uh, we got quite a few book recommendations this evening, didn't we? Uh, did. So, uh, would you like to run us through the uh, the books? Sure. Is that is that a Nick running through the books? Wait, wait. Nick, is that Bethann, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like our, our guest should. Uh, I, I, our guest <laughs> could take it away. Probably knows more okay. about the books than I do. Well, um, the problem, as discussed with everyone, is that all of my favorite books are out of print, and I don't want you all driving up the price on eBay. Um, having said that, Rails to Paradise is the definitive book on the history related to Mount Rainier, Phoenix Railroad, and Weyerhaeuser and Milwaukee Road operations in this area. Um, it'd be nice if y'all could, like, flip through it, read it, and then put it back on eBay for, like, five bucks less than you paid, so we don't keep trying. Oh, God, I would appreciate it. that so much. <laughs> right? Um, so I asked, I have not read, uh, the first two recommendations, but I did ask Rowdy for recommendations, and he said, Rails to the Minaret. Um, the Minaret Locomotives is a solid book, even though we are operating and not a minaret um and then there's logging railroads of warehousers um the vale mcdonald operation so i cannot vouch for either of those but they are still in print um and he has read them both and says that they are informative but dry um logging railroads in skagit county is sort of it's a lot of pictures um and we are not in skagit county but it's a really like it's just, it's a good compilation. Um, it's still in print. Um, and again, we're talking a lot about like some of the issues of it. This is just a, it's a hard and difficult topic to, to research. Um, but that is one I would recommend. Uh, I did mention Rails to Paradise. Um, Deadfall, Generations of Logging in the Pacific Northwest is one that, that I actually just ordered, um, and I'm pretty excited about, um, and then I am currently reading, which is a fiction book, I don't know how often you get those, um, Deep River, or Deep in the Woods, um, and I am actually, I'm listening to the audiobook, because my commute is a little bit long, um, but that's by Brian Johnston. And that's about George George Warehouser, the son of you know, the Warehouser Corporation, was kidnapped in the 30s and held for ransom. Oh wow! Um, so it's sort of and was you know in Tacoma and obviously where our, our line was a Warehouser line. Um, so it's a fiction book based on real story, um, and. I am currently listening to that one on Audible. Not my favorite narrator, but it's a really good story. Um, so if you're looking to get a little bit of, like, actually well-researched history, but as a fiction book, um, I would definitely re recommend that one. Interesting. Right on. in well, that whole list is on our, uh, is pin, is, I just, I typed, um, exclamation mark book. You too. I just realized that we got an LTE X engine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right on. Uh, that's our, <laughs> our brand of humor. Uh, from um, our resident spawner. Well, uh, the, why don't you knuckle in and we'll head back down the hill? But um, all of those books, if you type exclamation mark book in chat, you can get that whole list there. Uh, that list will probably go up on the link tree tomorrow um, or after the stream. So if you're watching this VOD back later, you'll be able to find it uh, on our link tree, which is always linked over in our bio. All right, got him. Well, shall we get down uh, back down the hill? 
Sure. I'm glad that you put a, a fictional book in there because I feel like that sometimes there's this attitude that, oh, if you want to learn the, the history of something, then, then you're then read nonfiction. Uh, and yes, that can certainly be true, but what fiction can do that nonfiction doesn't always is color in the pictures. Yeah. Because nonfiction can give you the architecture of something, but fiction can go more into, well, what did people feel like? And yes, some of it has to be conjecture, but if it's well researched, as you mentioned with your recommendation, then it's probably doing a halfway decent job of that and then it's educating one to a different side of the history not just through here's what happened here's the numbers here's the dates but here's here's reactions here's what uh, it was like to walk down the street in that time here were the the different social circles and the different class tiers yeah, you know, and that's what um, I think so much of what I connected and probably it's just like a background in archaeology is what is the, what does your day to day life look like, right? Is I care, my personal interest lies a lot more with what does the day to day look like when, rather than, um, you know, what did these corporations do and what did, um, you know, like what were the what were the business decisions being made in the boardroom, which is sort of ironic considering like that's most of what I'm doing now, but um, not quite at the same level of rich and fame, I don't think. But uh, um, yeah, like I just I want to know about the day to day, and I think for me, fiction sometimes um, like well researched historical fiction sometimes and like and helps me connect a lot better than um, sort of the dry anthologies is, you know, for as colorful as railroading is, sometimes it's hard to find some really, like, entertaining books on railroading that capture, uh, I don't know, you all know, like, just, yeah, no, no, I, I get the, what you're talking about. The craziness that is this industry is like the stories that I hear all of the time, I'm like, there is no way that's real. And then, like, you turn around and, like, three months later, you hear the same exact story from someone else, and you're like, oh, oh crap. I guess that was real. Um, but I'm hesitant to recommend my favorite book because I don't want the price of it to go off. Um, <laughs> but it, n not fiction. Um, you, you may want to really pinch it down there, Nick. You're uh, really flying in. Um, I like to keep things exciting. Set up running. Uh, the story of a uh, Pennsylvania Railroad engine man. He, that is stone print. It, so, yes, I know, but, but I still don't want the price driven up on it because it's a decent price right now. Um, oh, I haven't heard of that one. It so is can excellent. Can I be part of the problem? <laughs> be a part of the problem. It is an excellent book, way of life, story of a Pennsylvania Railroad engine man on the Williamsport division from 1900 oh, through 1945 or 46. He saw the first diesels arrive on the division. And like just the stories in it are absolutely amazing and you're like there's like there's no way like the railroad would run like that and then you're like okay yeah no it's no it that's that's got to be true um and it's so cool to see like it's from his son's eyes of his son retelling his dad's stories of like dad sitting down at night after getting off the engine and here here's what my day was and it's such a unique way of presenting it um, and I appreciate that. And I, I, I think we talked about this a f months ago, but of uh, museums being more, having more stuff like that. Of mm -hmm. this is what the railroad was like. This is who the people are. It's not just about mm -hmm. the uh, the choo choo. Uh, I'm calling it now. Uh, I know it's going to be a while, but especially based on what Rowdy said in in your latest vlog about. Uh, the, the geared engines uh, needing a while mm -hmm. to, to come back to life. But, you know, 10 years down the line, once you're st able to start uh, focusing on those as side projects, uh, I totally want a logging railroad LARP to happen in Mount Rainier. <laughs> I, I would I... like the geared races to come okay. back. The geared races. Uh huh. Oh, yes, the geared <laughs> races. Ooh. Yeah, let's get, we're going to get right on that. Um, 
I'm going to go back to my comments about how uh, most of these lo locomotives have been in tourist service as long as logging service. So we're getting to the point that we can no longer blame this whole Wild West logging thing. <laughs> the issues, the clapped out state of our locomotives. However, the geared engine races, I think that we can blame. Oh. That, that sounds fun. I, I recall a, a pun from Nick earlier this week uh, when he was to blame for something and uh, quoted a, a fairly recent Taylor Swift song. <laughs> it's me. Hi. I'm the problem. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Although, you wait, hold on though. Like, we're gonna we're gonna test just how many people are are uh, gonna make it over to our YouTube channel later because we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start seeing comments. Uh, there is a, a little someone somewhere said something about bringing the stats up or a little donkey back into service, and I was like, there is a conspiracy happening. So when I start seeing all these comments about the geared engine races, I'm gonna know who's behind it. Yes, yeah, so if you were out at Rail Cycle this summer, ask about the uh, geared races when you are visiting the Western Forest Industries Museum. <laughs> we should talk about the rail bikes a little bit because I think for yeah. those of us who really love the full size things, rail bikes kind of. We look at them and go, oh, okay. But honestly, as we've been learning more about what you guys are, are, are cooking up um, with your operation. I really want to try it now. Like, I'm actually excited to go out there and try rail biking because it sounds really fun. Yeah, uh, rail bikes are like the, the red-headed stepchild of um, the heritage railroad world sometimes. I mean, yours look a hell of a lot more comfortable than some of the others I've seen I, and sat in. We, um, like I said, my brother-in-law and I, my brother-in-law is a mechanical engineer, and it's it's nice that our family is still going to invite us to Christmas and Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> we've been talking about this for three years, um, <laughs> and we designed them. And there were just things about rail bikes on the market that I was like, hey, I don't like this. I want these things to be super accessible. I want them to be safe. Like, the... All of these like um, polyurethane like and rubber wheels on rail rail bikes. I'm like, that's not how a railroad works. That's not the most efficient way. It's got to be steel on steel. Um, you know, so it's sort of a a railroader designing a rail bike maybe instead of how most of them are designed, which is um, bikers designing something for a railroad. I I appreciate that. Uh, ours at our railroad were uh, new tour were known for. Uh falling apart yeah, we, so we like bought them and then, we bought them and then knocked them off and then made our own knockoffs <laughs> yeah. um and they were just all, um, yeah. like bent aluminum construction so they're actually mm. they're constructed rather than being welded like i think every other bike is on the market now they're made the same way that a car is <laughs> hmm. um and yeah like we're using railroad wheels um because as far as i'm concerned uh, I'm not going to improve on 150 year old technology. Um, so, steel on steel, that sounds great. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we're also doing some things like we really, the step over point for the bikes is really, really low. And we wanted like a higher weight limit and we wanted a grate. And we're working on um, not all of our accessibility options are ready to go but it's, it's going to be a process and we're going to learn a lot like so we're working on hand pedal adapter adapters and we're o also mm. working on a wheelchair accessible bike um oh, cool. which i'm really excited about so um we're working on building a platform that you can literally drive a um wheelchair right up onto oh that is very cool um you know and i really want them to be because it is um a totally different way of experiencing the railroad that the general public doesn't get to do. Like all of the reasons I love is being in a high rail alone. Maybe not all of them because I probably we're not going to give our <laughs> guest chainsaws and say go clear some railroad. Uh, but like you know, like being lowered to the rail and sort of hearing and 
going to be a little phony, but like hearing the sound of the steel on steel and like going over the joints, you know, in the railroad and hearing the clank and um, I think, you, you know, like you just get to see the track and the scenery better than you do on a train and it, it doesn't, it's just a different experience um, and it's another way for us to generate income. It's a way for us to get people interested in the railroad that might not be. Um, you know, I know that this is a community that's super interested in railroading, but um, we're in, like, we're located outside Seattle and Mount Rainier and, like, climbing and outdoor recreation is so much bigger than heritage tourism. Mm -hmm. um, so let's capitalize on that. And if I can, like, sneak them into, like, if I can, you know, like... Know, subliminally plant ideas that maybe a steam engine is cool along the way um then fantastic and you know part of this is we don't have a benefactor we don't have an endowment um we need to make business decisions that are going to make a profit um because contrary to popular belief uh the 17 does not run on oil she just runs on dollar bills <laughs> uh you know i so, shovel those into a firebox <laughs> yeah exa that's exactly what yeah that's exactly what we do. Uh, Let's... Like joking, joking, but not. You know, so yeah. we need to. Um, we need to make sure that even though we're a nonprofit, that we're a viable business and that we're making a profit because it's not truly a profit because we just are going to reinvest it all in the equipment. Um, um, so you mentioned trying to get people uh, interested in steam locomotives along the way, and. One of the things I saw mm -hmm. my railroad did really well with their rail bikes is uh, the steam engine would come back from its turn and it would stop at the end of the runaround um, and it would be spotted exactly with where the rail bikes were leaving from in the yard. Yeah. So like I you're mean, there, stopped, a, you sure. and like they look they look right at the steam engine on their way by, and it's like yeah, and that's, that's what I we can do next. I want this photo op for marketing, you know, like I it's, want my it was a cool photo yellow op. rail bikes by, uh, by my steam engine. Uh, um, Nick, I have not heard from Rudy if we're clear to come back in yet. Uh, you are not. Okay, we are not. All right, so uh, bring it to the stop here, Nick. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a uh, westbound coming down the hill. I believe it's in your block. And uh, if that gets by you, uh, we'll get you in. Well, hi, I'm going to set up for like a photo event here i'm gonna i'm gonna rail fan a little yeah. um <laughs> it, I, I i love rail bikes i'm super happy with them um as like a concept i i know that's i don't know some people in the industry may be upset by it and like i don't know it's all about the steam engine but i don't know i think you get a different clientele um, i totally get it though like because there's um there isn't regulation, there isn't best practice, there isn't, um, like, we're going through, like, as we're going through g Corps, we're saying, okay, these rules apply to the railroad, and we're basically running it as, like, we're the same rules that we would for, like, a maintenance away program, which is probably that's, overkill. That's exactly how we, uh, would do it, too. It's, uh, you treat it like yeah, an MOW, like, uh... Um, but, you know, like, it's, it's on isolated track, it's, you know, like, all, all of those things, um... You know, we're putting our rail cycle guides through our roadway worker program. Um, oh, nice. And, yeah, like, is it technically probably overkill? Yes. Um, do we have any room to have issues? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it's just, it's something that I'm not going to play with. And, like, we're not, um, we've got two farm crossings we're going over, but we're just, we elected to operate on a section of track that we don't have to deal with any crossings on, um, that we don't have train movement planned on. So, you know, we're being really cautious about the way we, we start this, um, operation, you know? Mm hmm And, and uh, yeah, no, I, I love that. I, it's kind of yeah, nice that then, there's a, not the, like, overbearing regulation, but I, I don't know, I, kind of expected the FRA to put something out by now in the CFR of like in the yeah. MOW section like an addendum of here's how you do this. I mean I, I think that they're probably also opening such a can of worms and they're also like if they start putting rules in then do they have to be checking on those rules and regulating them and you know like 
man, I don't know if anyone's talked to their, like, FRA inspectors, but they are all overworked and exhausted right now. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't it, envy their jobs right now. No, their, their job got a lot worse in the last couple of years, um, yeah, especially yeah, on the yeah. steam inspector side. Yeah, um, and I mean, and that's, that's what I go back to. It's like, man, like, Heritage Railroads need to work together and be encouraging, like, best practices with safety and... Mm-hmm. Um, operations and how we're doing, you know, like mechanical work because um, ultimately, like, I just, I don't see that we're in competition. We're all in the same game. Um, And we want to make sure that this industry is healthy and that it's something that um, is going to be around for another hundred years. Yeah. I, I wish, I'm happy with how many railroads are finally starting to communicate with each other as our generation is getting uh, into leadership positions. I think that's really healthy for the industry. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I do want to hit a couple of messages that we got. Um, Cheeky Bus Driver said, uh, I can say as a fat guy, uh, the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad's rail bikes are wonderfully easy to pedal uphill. So props to you guys there. Um, <laughs> uh, Icer the Blue, what would be the best logging loco that is not a geared Shea or Climax? I'm gonna have to go with a um, um, a Malley Mogul, one of the the Weyerhaeuser uh, Rainier 2662s. Um, I don't know what they uh, What was the? What, hold on, it like I I have to pick a rod locomotive. You have to pick a rod locomotive. We're looking at um. I don't. I don't know I, that I, I want I to don't, know. I don't. I. I have zero interest in knowing. Okay, so back to the the, the favorite <laughs> logging. So yeah, you you have you have to pick one that is not geared. You mean uh-huh. not rod? No, no, not geared. Not geared. Oh. Not, not geared. geared. I have to pick a rod engine. But hang on, they, they need a pee in a cup. They didn't whistle for the crossing or flag and protect. Yeah, debauchery of the highest degree. Uh, well, someone flipped uh, our switch. Well. Uh, 109, you are clear out onto the main. Uh, you are lined into the correct yard track uh, in Bryson. All right. Take her uh, west, Nick. So not ah. a geared engine. Favorite? Uh... Did you notice my silence? <laughs> uh <laughs> So, yeah, uh, was there no, <laughs> uh, but it, w- best? What is the criteria for best? I don't know. I'm reading I mean, that as... 70, interpret the 70 as you best, will. The 70 is our best engine. Um, Ooh, you have... Best, right? Not favorite? I said best. Okay, uh, good. The 70 good. is Just... currently our best engine. Okay. It is not my favorite engine. Oh, I can't have favorites. Um, they get mad at me. I well, I I have a like. My Oh, we just, I think we just lost the Beth in there a little bit. Oh, did you? Up, oh, no, now we're back. You're, you're yeah, good. you 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 went all uh, roboty. Oh. That's signal I read that you just I was upgraded. Oh, thanks your permission to pass signal of danger. Yep. Wow, you guys have um, cleaned out this yard. We should go up on the logging branch more often. Um, are there engines here? How, how full is this yard? Rudy? Hello? You Anyone? Are. There you are. Um, well, uh, we gotta take a quick break, folks. I have to restart the game, uh, cause I am experiencing a glitch right now. Cool. Oh, yeah, I see it on my end, too. Yep. So, uh, we'll be right back, uh, after this brief break.
Well, we're back. Sorry about that. Alpha build, am I right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, game's back up, guys. You guys can, uh, let everyone know you can hop back in. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so, sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, we're coming back into the yard. Our next move from here is, uh, we gotta take these cars out to the sawmill. And, uh, get some stuff delivered. Um, and, uh, find out from the yard master, uh, how, uh, how this is all gonna be going down. Uh, what he needs us to do. Or he already escaped back to the other channel. Not sure. Not sure. I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll hear soon. I think he's listening in. He will let us know telepathically. Yes, or discordpathically. Oh, and there's the next uh, log train heading up the hill. Busy oh. logging railroad. So, favorite rod locomotives? In, in logging rod logging locomotive. Logging rod. Yes. I don't know. It's. I, I, I'm gonna go with this one. Uh, I am a fan of the non minaret. You're a fan of the non minaret. All right. Uh, shall we get this uh thing over to the uh the engine servicing and uh, get this thirsty thing filled up while uh, we wait for our, uh, to find out what we're doing next? Or our engine. <laughs> Hello. Hi. All right. Uh, um, you'll let us know when our train's made up. Yep. I already got the power pulled out for it, so it should be pretty quick. Sweet. Uh, yeah, we saw that coming in. I guess we're taking 40. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, get the log train to clear that into the yard so I can start switching. So. I will right maybe on. give an honorable mention to Skookum, since it is so mm, uh, cool. funky. As far as logging Mikado, logging stuff is so answer. cool. A Mikado is only the only real answer, though I, I have a I have a soft spot for the um the uh what you call it? The Mali Moguls, the Weyerhausers. Weyerhausers? I don't know how to pronounce that railroad. Where Weyerhauser. Weyerhauser? My, Although, uh, I don't know. They always make fun of me for sounding like I'm from New York, and I'm like, I. I was, I was gonna say my New, my New York may be showing there. Yeah, I was gonna like I, I retract any any pronunciations that I may, I may, may give to be. All right, we need the water. Corrected. All right, so we just need water, Nick. You know. And I guess we'll leave this here for the uh, the hostler to deal with. Mm-hmm. <sighs> All right. Um, we had a viewer question come in earlier this week, and uh, you and I were talking about this earlier, Bethann. But the Heisler, there's videos of it running with the um, keep rolling back, Nick, with the third truck connected on the tender. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the tender, and there's videos yeah. of it running uh, without that connected. What's up with that? Okay, so I asked Rowdy. Uh, and I asked Brian, and they both went from like zero to sixty-five in like I don't know a tenth of a second, and they were like, "Well, that was the dumbest thing." Um, <laughs> so apparently, in the, in the, which I, I didn't realize that I was asking them. Uh, apparently, in the early nineties, uh, they were experimenting with nylotron bearing, and. All I could get out of them was it went terribly wrong, faster, um, stupid, stupid. But I mean, but let's think of a lot more colorful language here. Yes. Um, and they just never hooked the rear truck, uh, truck back up because they didn't have bearings. Well, I got simple answer. Cool experiment. I, I guess <laughs> cool experimenting with different material, but yeah. 
yeah, I don't. I, it's apparently I'm guessing there is more to the story, but uh, that's what I got. Well, that's that's still pretty cool nonetheless, and kind of crazy that um, you know, spotted it uh while watching. You know, he's yeah. a he's a super fan of the other railroad, and kind of yeah, crazy I, that he just I, uh, spotted it while uh while yeah, going about his day. They were like, the hell that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, uh, I've, I've run down the yard over to, uh, Caboose 25 to wait for, uh, this train to get made up. I figured I'd, I'd stand in the gauge here on the main and foam a little. Highly responsible. Yeah, right? You know, I see, I see a red signal on that end, so I don't think anything's coming. Uh, well, how is everyone doing out there tonight? Uh, hope you're enjoying logging railroads out there, um, near and dear to. I I know. I, I don't, logging railroads are cool. I'm I like learning more about them. I only know the East Coast stuff. I know, uh, really, just Cass. Um, and that's that's kind of like my only experience in logging. Um, despite having never made it out there to see Cass at all, Dang. and being so close. You're closer to me. You have less of an excuse. Wow. I know. I know. <laughs> and I've been closer to there for two years, and I have still not made it out there. And Walter Scriptunus, who has been on the Roundhouse podcast, is quick to remind me of that point. Yeah, so, so you're going to make it out to Mount Rainier before you make it <laughs> like, down the cast? street. I mean, to uh, be fair, you guys have cooler logging stuff. So here's... At least engines. And, and the other reason is because growing up, when I was a wee lad, one of my favorite <laughs> of my uh, videotape experiences was the Pentrex documentary on Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, uh, which I recently rewatched recently, not because mm -hmm. I have a, a v uh, VCR, but because you can actually find it on YouTube. It's so. on YouTube now. I yeah. know that because, um, yeah. I put, when I put my two-year-old son to bed at night, he gets, we don't really do screen time, but he gets 10 minutes of videos a day, and he gets to pick and Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad YouTube, like, videos from the <laughs> 80s and 90s are his jam, and I'm like, oh, what little foamer am I raising? But, uh, he knows, um, four numbers now, he knows one, two, three, and seventy. I think those are the important ones. Yep. <laughs> as far as he's concerned. So Wait, that's funny, Nick. Cause, uh... Uh... Good Hello, know... Mr. Yardmaster. Yes. Hi. I believe uh, 40 your train is uh, good to head east, and you are clear and lined out of the yard. All right. Copy that. 40 is clear to head east. Uh, do we have... Is my crew on board? I am on board. That's up to you guys. Uh, Beth Ann, you on board somewhere? Uh, no. Logs. <laughs> Log train. Uh, you're going to have a meet in uh, in Governor's Island. Okay, cool. So. I'm there, I, believe, I believe they're already there in the siding waiting for you. So. Alright, well, uh, we'll see them shortly. Uh, I am... Oh, God. You also I'm about to have a kinda, meet right alongside you there, too. Alright, uh, you want to climb onto this guy? Uh -huh. If you want to sit in the fireman's seat, I'll go back to the caboose. Entirely up to you. Uh, oh. sure. Just because, like, by the time I make it... Alright, um... So, this control is... click on the steam engine. On the actual oh. locomotive, not the tender. Is that an option? Yes. Yep. C control left click on the steam locomotive. Hit select. Alrighty. Oh, that didn't work. What am I doing? Uh, and then you should you're, get like a you're little. Losing, you... You're losing viewers as you speak. Yeah, it's okay. I'm not really. Alright, and uh, okay. yeah, just uh, in. pop in the fireman seat. Ready, okay. Nick? I am ready. I'm, I'm going for the caboose. Alright, uh, well, I'm going to do the, um, the meme thing here really quick. And just put that, pull that thing all the way out. You 
do that. Oh, I'm enjoying the beat back here, honestly. This is good by me. So, uh, for our viewing audience, uh, any questions uh, for our esteemed guest about the, the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, uh, past, present, future, uh, what whistle will it wear? Questions of that nature. <laughs> The whistles haven't been decided. I will tell you that. Uh, oh, that's fair. I thought that was the debate. first thing you pick, was the whistles. There is debate. So, and that's one of those things that, like, you know, Brian and Rowdy are working on these things, uh, like, 50 hours a week, and I'm not. So they, they, they get to... They get to override any, any of my opinions. Well... Uh, while we're uh, waiting for folks to submit their questions, I'll, I'll put another one of mine out there, which is, of everything that you've been encountering so far in this adventure, uh, I'm sure there's been plenty of uh, unpleasant surprises, but what has been perhaps the most pleasant surprise, uh, something unexpected that you, you weren't planning on going in that you've experienced uh, that has that you've enjoyed or that's been beneficial for what you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, our volunteers. Oh, am I still connected? Yeah, you're still connected. Yep. Yeah, we yep, still okay. hear you. Yep, we still hear you. Um, it went, it went like, oh. um, I'll be interested to know what the answer is in like three months. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the last year of this, for me has been really lonely because it's, it's been a a one person I mean Brian Brian has been in the shop and maintaining the grounds um, but like the, the business side of things it's been a, a one person show saying like okay like what the hell is, are my ideas and what is my plan and um, you know it's, it's been yeah, it was just me in my home office saying, like, this is dumb. Um, <laughs> and the volunteer turnout um, has been amazing, and I am just so stinking happy and proud to see how... Um, and I, when I say how young our volunteer base is, um, that is with a tremendous amount of respect for the volunteers that have been around, right? And even we've got some new folks that are newly retired um, that are, you know, like, that are showing up and they've got time in the weekdays to come down and, like, so grateful for them. But um, for me, being able to, like, have high school kids that say, like, hey, I want to go into railroading and this seems like a good place to learn. Is that okay? Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, yes, um, and we had, um, one guy who's, well, it's two of them, uh, 17 and 18, and like, hey, I want to go into railroading, like, is there an internship possibility, and, you know, blah, 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 and it's just, um, like, they are so nice and so proactive and so helpful, um, and for the longest time, I was the kid, <laughs> um, that didn't, like, you know, that just, I was, I had always, I don't know, like, I started in this railroad world, and I, I don't know, when I was 21, 22, and, um, even now, by most standards, I'm still a young whippersnapper, um, but seeing, like, feeling like I am sort of the elder statesman, and watching all of these folks that are energized and younger than I am, um, get interested, because, you know, like we talk about so much in this industry, we talk about like who's going to be there. These, you know, these things are going to go away. Like the volunteers are dying. Like the talent is dying. The knowledge is. And now, um, you know, we've got folks now that sort of learn from the people that originally ran and maintained the full locomotive. Um, so sort of second generation, and now we're to the third generation, um, you know, sort of removed from these logging operations, and to see such a good community, and like, this group of, 
you know, for the most part, guys in the 20s show up um, every weekend and how, like, it's a railroad. Like, we absolutely make fun of each other and no one's delicate about anything, but um, they are welcoming, they are inclusive, they are warm. Um, and to see that and experience that is, like, it's just a joy. Um, like, and I, yeah, it just, it fills my little heart and makes it gross, grocery sizes. <laughs> <laughs> it's tremendous that you're providing that experience for these people because the, there's, there are a lot of functioning tourist railroads in the state of Washington right now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for them to have something that they can engage with quote unquote for fun um, and, and that can lead to to do bigger and better things for them but even just developing school uh, or skills and uh, and team building even on those levels it's phenomenal yeah, I'm... yeah and I mean like if we lose them to a short line a few years down the road like so be it that's okay <laughs> you know like that's um and I pick on Tim, or Scott, and Tim and Andy, and, you know, they're, they all have railroad jobs, and they're coming back to help. Um, that's, uh... You know, sort of saying, I got my start here, so I'm going to give back. That's one of the things that, uh, one of the guys who brought me up, uh, in the industry, uh, said was, you know, like, I, I could, like, he personally, not so much the, the general manager, but he personally considered it to be a, a teaching railroad. And he was happy when people left and got a job at a different tourist railroad, a short line, a class one. And to be that reference, to be like, yeah, no, they're, they're good. We taught them well. And I, yeah. I think, it, I think that's the perfect way to think of the tourist industry. And as, um, yeah. like, as, uh, like a moving forward of like, this is a place where you start when you're young, you get your, get your chops, you learn good stuff early, and then you move on to bigger and better things. And m- maybe you come back and, five ten years and you start helping out again yeah it's, and that's it is you know um i want you know at the, at the end of the day if they're picked up by another railroad i want the railroad to be impressed with their skills and their knowledge and their diligence um mm-hmm. you know, yeah and then as far as i'm concerned we've we've done we've done our job you know, it's, it's part of preservation is um, teaching the skills. It's it's not gatekeeping. It's it's teaching the skills needed to um, help keep this industry alive. Yeah. Um. No, as we, we have a question from yeah. the Goose Man, who says, "Not really, uh, not really a scenic railroad question, but." What are your favorite whistles? Oh, I hate this question. I can never decide. I'm a musician. It's hard for me to pick my favorite chord. Oh, oh e- e- easy for me. Uh, CP, four chime, and uh, NNW hooter. Um, that being said, I'm gonna have to go with a um, a very very basic SP6. It's it's like the Lionel whistle. It just sounds so good. Um, so that's my basic answer. But I'm happy to play with any whistle that's on the engine. Um, no, we are getting close to the sawmill and uh, towards the end of the stream. Uh, so I did want to throw uh, out there. Wait, wait, wait Beth, did there... add any whistle preferences on your side of things? My toddler's favorite is currently the the three time handcuff. Mm, so gonna, good choice. I'm just gonna I'm gonna throw that one out there. Uh, I really could do care about. <laughs> <laughs> if it goes too too, it does the trick. But Martin has a clear preference. Um, so we are getting close to the end. Uh, we're in a Baldwin, 90 ton logging Mikado, which is not quite 70 bigger bigger sister um but uh you know you, you were talking a lot about 70 uh this whole stream and mm-hmm. as part of the restoration um so we were just wanted to give a shout out and a thank you to adam and the modeling team for 
letting us get the show off this engine uh, in the stream. And since it is such a big part of uh, what the Mount Rainier Scenic is, is the Baldwin locking engines. Um, and, so we're, we're very grateful for that. And uh, our last question that we'll take comes from Train Z Builder 2000. What's the first stage of the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad's restoration? The first stage, um, I mean, I'd say we're already, like, we're, we're in the midst of that now, and that's, um, you know, at least getting a basic tourist train service running, albeit not on our line, and getting income in through the rail bike. Um, so I would say we are, like, one month away from uh, the first stage being executed in full force. Um, We've got to do we've got to do bridge repairs um, on our line. We've submitted a whole ton of grants um, to restore the line to Eatonville and to do all of the bridge work that we need to do along the line. So we'd really like to be running from Eatonville to Mineral, which is an 18 mile excursion. Um, when we open, like even if we don't have a station built, if we can build a parking lot and sort of. You know, it'll be a little bit of a ramshackle thing for now, but um, that's that's my goal for the next phase. So, eighteen miles is quite a nice, uh, a little <laughs> sarcasm there. Run. It's a good, it's a good chunk. Um, you know, like the six mile run we have between LB and Mineral. LB just doesn't have the infrastructure in the parking lot to um, support our operation right now. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, that's the railroads run on economies of scale, right? So if I'm tapped out on parking for four passenger cars, that doesn't do for our larger events, right? And then yeah. we're just sort of kicking ourselves, um, you know, and, and shorting out our ability to make a profit, especially because we have more passenger cars than that. Um, you know, that are in good working operations. So we need to be able to put them on a train and sell them. Uh, so that makes Eatonville a pretty, and Eatonville also has restaurants and a hotel and those things that LB just doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nick, you mind getting the switch into the sawmill? Uh, hold on. Yep. I can do that as a thing. Uh, um, and... Yeah, no, infrastructure's... I don't know, I don't think anyone talks about it enough of, like... That's really, like, everyone's like, run longer trains, run to this location, but... You need the cars, you need the people, you need the parking lot space to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, why, um, it's not like... <laughs> like, that's not the, the sexy part of steam railroading, if such a thing exists. Um, but... but we're not it's here to talk about the sexy part of steam railroad. <laughs> We're here to talk about <laughs> the nitty gritty uh, of it all. Yeah, uh, but it's what it's you know it's it's what's gonna keep the steam engine going to choo ultimately. And that is my goal in everything I do. Is like okay, what decisions are gonna make sure that we are here in another five, ten, twenty, a hundred years? Mm -hmm. That's, Crazy um, Builder 2000 says, thanks for answering my question, Mrs. Marr, and I wish you and WFIM luck on the restoration. And I will plug them and say you could do, uh, you could wish them luck, but you can also, critically, uh, support them on Patreon by uh, going to uh, their website, uh, WFIM.org, and there's links to their social media there, the YouTube videos, and the Patreon, uh, where for, uh, I think the first year is $2 a month, and you're, mm -hmm. you're going to support uh, the work that Beth and her crew are doing. Um, and if you're able to support them with larger donations, obviously, or by uh, participating in their upcoming events, that is, yeah. of course, And appreciate. if you're local, come hang out and volunteer. Like, we're not too yeah. scary. Absolutely. Again, uh, if you go uh, exclamation mark Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad in chat, that will be there for you to be able to find their website, find all their information, their social media. Uh, if you're watching this later, we'll also put that down in the comments. I'm pointing below, but you can't see me. Um, 
And if you guys had a good time tonight, be sure to check out our Discord for the VRA and stay up to date on all things VRA, railroading. Uh, we, we have a good time over there. It's a lot of fun, and you should definitely check that out. Um, thank you so much, Beth, yeah. for joining us tonight. Yeah, seriously, yeah. thank you. We so. hope you enjoyed your first video game in uh, 25 years. Yeah, I mean, well, thank you for putting up with me. Like, it, it, it was an absolute blast to have you on and uh, <laughs> getting to run you through this earlier in the week. Next time <laughs> I we'll, we'll... lost the locomotive earlier in the week. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, we'll definitely put you on train crew. We'll assume that now that you've come back into uh, the world of video gaming, listen, that you'll be all set listen, for Yeah, you know, you, you passed your check ride. Congratulations, you're a brakeman. Oh, good. Um, oh, good. No P <laughs> test required. Test. Well, <laughs> I feel honored. Uh, and uh, Rule G, it's expected to be violated on this railroad. Uh, so fine. bring it's your fine. own scotch. <laughs> <laughs> um, that sounds good. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please go support the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad. They're doing what I think is some of the coolest stuff in preservation right now. And we're so uh, thankful for having you on the stream tonight. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you all. all right. And thank as always, much. I'm Professor Casey. And I'm Professor Nick. And thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I'm trying to find the button. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> See y'all.